Well, I'm almost done the black. I uh, have to keep going over and over and over it. There's a couple things I wanted to mention today um, for anybody interested in getting into this. The first being um, matching colors. So whatever you're doing a portrait of, basically, you're going to have to match your thread to that color. The reason that there's not universal conversion lists for thread colors is because any two colors may appear to match under a certain spectrum of light. But the minute that you change that light spectrum, the colors may not match anymore. So you have to keep in mind where your item is going to be displayed or what it's going to be used for and what type of light it's going to be under. And use this light, whatever light it's intended for, um, to proof your colors. I work under um, daylight or 5000 K spectrum usually and I have a whole whack of lights around me as I'm working um, for, so I can see what I'm doing but also to match color because I'm sewing according to the color that I see on the printout here on the paper solvi and sometimes it's quite hard to distinguish but you know I'm not too worried about that because I can go over areas with another color if it's not right if I feel it needs to be a little bit different in the end but that's really what I wanted to mention about color matching you need to work under the light and match the colors under the light that the item is going to be displayed under so I prefer daylight spectrum um, no matter where and how I'm going to display my work I use the same light to proof my photos um, to edit my photos I use the same spectrum this is my workroom my craft room and I do uh, printing I do sewing I do the thread painting I do photo editing and I match my colors in this room as well now um, what I've done is I picked up um, a Madeira thread chart so that I can shop for my colors and I can match them to the work that I'm doing. There's maybe some 500 colors in the Madeira Poly Neon line. That's the polyester embroidery thread. They also make a rayon. The classic is a rayon line. But I like the Poly Neon. Polyester is, you know, it's a little bit stronger. And the colors are just fabulous. I mean, they're vibrant, they're shiny, and it's durable thread. The only thing you want to keep in mind is you don't want to press it with really hot heat. It will melt. Polyester will melt. So you've got to keep the temperature down if you need to press it, or you need to put a damp cloth or uh, a pressing cloth between the iron and the work. You can also use parchment paper. Parchment paper is great. I use it a lot because it withstands the heat. It's used in the oven. I also uh, use these um, Teflon sheets. This is a, a Coquina Teflon sheet. And I'm using this for my um, slip slider at the moment because I haven't splurged on a, a, a slip mat yet. Um, this seems to be working all right. I've tried it without today and I prefer the slip mat. So if you're gonna be working in a particular line of thread and buying your colors, I mean, you can use different brands if you want, but it's easier to build up a collection if you stick with one brand. I, I'm partial to Madeira. I just love it. And um, it's decently priced. It's not, you know, it's not a crazy uh, amount of money. I was buying the smaller um, threads from Fabricville, Fabricland, and I was paying $7 for 200 meters Canadian, which is absurd when you know for $6.99 I can get a thousand meters of Madeira at, at um, Nova. Nova is where I bought my machine and where I buy my thread. <coughs> so <coughs> I really like the Madeira line and I'm using it for sewing as well. I do have cotton. I do have non shiny polyester as well for sewing. I have a lot of Guterman in that case. 
but I really like um, the number of colors that Madeira has and when you're doing top stitching it's just gorgeous and knowing it's polyester you know I like that so now I have just a little bit more black to do and I know you can't see it at this point but I'm just going to raise the needle and I'm going to jump over I'm not going to cut my thread I can cut these manually later so I'm just doing it this way to keep the tension on the needle and to be quick and I'm going to drop my needle again and I'm going to continue sewing on this last little bit of black that I have to do before I switch colors now I've chosen to sew relatively slowly because not that I can't go faster <coughs> but this gives me time to plan where I'm going to go next and to distinguish where the colors change because this is a faded printout um, this was done on my old printer not my new Canon and it, it's you know not color correct for one and it's a little bit faded and crappy color the inks just didn't flow well on that printer so that's why I got a new one so anyhow I'm just going to continue okay my light fell down that's my extra fluorescent but it doesn't matter at the moment I have three or four other lights around me here LED um, daylight spectrum lights and most of them are clip-ons in addition to um, the light that comes on the machine and I'm using that as well because it really is well positioned so this is pretty slow going really but anything worthwhile takes time to do a good job and I really want to enjoy the process this has become important to me you know I don't want to rush and then regret it because uh, this is a fairly big project and there's an investment in it I'm not just the tr thread but the flexiferm in my time even the you know 12 sheets of paper solvi for the picture template like this is not cheap mind you this is a really large piece of work if you can imagine 12 letter size papers glued together and then um, stitched on top of so it's not a small embroidery most freehand thread paintings are not this big now um, I should have made something smaller for you know a first time project but this is really what I wanted to make this is what I had in my in my in my mind and in my heart to do. This was the reason I wanted to do a thread painting because I wanted one of my dogs. I'm sure I could have took a picture and um, put it in a frame. This is a little more personal. This takes some observation. It it causes me to really look at my dogs, their coloring, and um, in turn, you know that kind of is burnt into my brain as a memory. I can remember things about them. I reflect upon them. This is a time I can really do a lot of meditating. And it's therapeutic. Kind of like um, sewing is in general. Some people it's gardening, you know, other people it's sewing, crafts. I can't wait to start a new color. I'm just tired of black. Now I haven't even gone through a thousand meters of, of black yet. I probably have maybe, um, let's see, maybe, I don't know, a quarter of the spool left. So that's not too bad considering a lot of this, um, a lot of this project is black. Now I'm going to cut that jump thread now. I could do it later. I'm not going to cut it on the back. It's just going to get stitched over with the layers.
jumping is, it, it's, you know, it's nice because you don't have to uh, be feeding the threads through and have ends hanging out. You jump and you worry about the uh, cutting the end after and you have less to tie off. Now, earlier today, I was using the open toe foot here. The problem with that one is when you're pulling the work to, towards you, or I think it's towards you, the thread can loop around one of the ends of the opening and um, cause some eyelashing on the top, which is what you don't want. Um, that was happening because it was fairly dense on the underneath and the tension was off because of the, the amount of thread on the underside even though I'm using a, a 60 weight underneath the superior bottom line thread. Um, so I've switched back to uh, this foot that's closed toe on the end. Now what I did to cover some of the eyelashing that I had because it really didn't look nice and if you got close you could see it and I'm such a perfectionist it drives me crazy I put on my F2 foot here and I put it in <coughs> I put the feed dogs up and I did some straight stitching over those areas to cover it up because you, you can have mega layers on this and it will give it some depth um, so that's what I did and the, the good thing about this foot is you can have a really big buildup and it still goes over it, no problem. When you're free motion quilting, sometimes you're going to have problems when there's a lot of buildup. So you have to be very um, aware of your speed um, and um, angles and everything else. What I do is I work back and forth, back and forth, and I slowly move over to the area I want to go next. And that way I lay down a good amount of thread and build it up so that it will be solid color. Because when I dissolve the paper solvy underneath the thread, there's going to be some white marks. There's going to be some spaces where I've not laid down enough thread. Because the diagram underneath has the color I'm covering, I can't tell yet. I can just do the best that I can and later I can touch up those areas. Or they will be covered with uh, um, a highlighted layer on top. So that's why there's areas I don't think you can see it. There's areas say in um, my dog's coat here that I've just left open because that's going to be mostly silver. Um, that area is highlighted by light. Is the display upside down? Yeah. It's highlighted with light but it looks silver. So I'm not even going to bother filling that in with black. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to go over it with silver and then if I have to shadow and highlight further, I will. Anyhow, um, that's pretty much what's been going on. Um, I only get a couple hours a day really to sew. Undisturbed. My dogs get antsy at some point and I have to put it away. But I'm really hoping to finish the black today. So I have to get relatively close here at times um, <clears throat> to see what I'm doing. I, part of it's my eyes, and part of it's just the fact that um, the printout isn't that dark, and it's not that clear, so I have to make some um, judgments some artistic judgments as I'm sewing. If they're wrong, you know, I'll fix it later. Um, but generally, if you have ever painted or drawn, you know, you get a feel for things. So it's just back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over until you've got good coverage. Because I'm using paper salvi, when the needle goes through, and I've done several layers very close together, um, some of the paper might pop up, curl or, or shred, and it's getting in the way, kind of. But I'm just ignoring it at this point. Because later I'm going to dissolve it all. But it makes some of my um, 
makes makes it hard to judge whether I've covered an area good sometimes. Now I imagine there is probably another material I could have used to put the picture of the dogs on as, as a color template. However, the reason I chose the paper salvi is because I had to paste 12 sheets together to print this poster out, to put a poster together to put on the Flexifirm. And the um, H2O gone, the minute that you put glue, water, or anything on it to try to join sheets together, it dissolves and wrinkles. And the paper salvi doesn't. I have quite a bit of stabilizer and stuff, but the paper salvi seem to be the best for my purpose. I do have some transparent, which is massive and wouldn't have needed to be cut. However, I can't print on it. Now I should buy some sheets for such a purpose because I wouldn't get this paper shredding going on. But lots of people stitch into paper. What I join together the pieces with is just Elmer's glue, you know, the normal washable school glue. The reason that I use that is because it will wash out and I want all traces of the paper out at some point. I'm going to have to probably soak this in a tub of cold water and, you know, slightly agitate it for a while to get out all the paper salvi. Then I'm going to have to dry it, probably hang it to dry. I don't really want to press it. I mean, you could uh, on lower heat, but I don't really want to unless it needs it. However, the Flexifirm should, you know, keep it flat, should keep any puckering from happening. That's why I chose Flexifirm as my base. And then, after it dries, I will fill in all the gaps that are missing. And the plan is after the whole piece is finished, I'm going to stitch it with invisible thread all along the edge of, of the image, all around it. And then I'm going to trim it down. And then I'm going to slightly um, wash the background with a contrasting color so that it's going to be um, rectangular. I was thinking of maybe using um, a red permanent ink or maybe fabric paint. I'm not sure yet. I want. I just want it to be like a wash on top of the canvas. I just want to use something like, um, I don't know, I was thinking something heavier like um, canvas like you have for a drop cloth or something. I have some. I've been saving it. Of course, I need a decent piece of uh, material, but you want something heavier for something that is already a heavy piece of work for support. And then um, I want to frame it and hang it up. Possibly frame it. It would be nice if I could get it in the frame, but that would be an awful big frame. Maybe I'll have uh, somebody in my family make me one. Ideally, you know, with all this work and time, it would be great to have it under glass, but we'll see. But definitely protect it over time. This is going to be a keepsake. Our dogs don't live forever. But this is my um, my dogs were gifts to me for my family, and they're the first dogs that were mine. You know, they didn't belong to the whole family. They were purchased for me as companions, and I love them to pieces. bigger one is three years old, her name is Cookie, and the small one is two years old, and her name is Bitsy. We got Bitsy 
as a companion for Cookie because Cookie just wanted to play and I couldn't fulfill that need in her, you know, all day, every day. I mean, she would mope if I didn't play with her. So, and she wouldn't eat well either. For the first couple years of her life, she was pretty sick. And the vet diagnosed her with autoimmune disease. So she kept me busy. But uh, she didn't, um, she didn't get her fulfillment you know, from just spending time with me, she wanted to play. She wanted vigorous activity that I couldn't always give her. So Bitsy has been a good buddy for her. And now, you know, if I go outside for a few minutes, Cookie doesn't feel lonely anymore. She has Bitsy with her. It turns out, you know, Bitsy has become my shadow. And Cookie is now my big girl. They're both Chihuahuas. And uh, we got them from a breeder in Ottawa. I got Cookie when she was three months old and weighed only one pound. And she was so tiny, she slept, she slept cir circled up in my neck every night. Um, she was just the tiniest little thing. Bitsy we, we got when she was eight months old. So we didn't, you know, we didn't get to have her when she was tiny, but she's turned out to be a wonderful dog as well. We got her from the same breeder. So yeah, I have to turn this around sometimes to see what I'm doing, but so far I haven't ripped any stitching out. So I could go a little faster, like I said, but this is much better for seeing what I'm doing. And uh, anticipating my next move. Now the next type of project that I do, that I thread paint, I have some different ideas of how I would approach it. To begin with, I would do it on a thinner material and I might hoop it. I would use stabilizer on the back and I might even starch it, stiffen it up a bit. And before I did any thread painting, I think that I would um, put the image on the material and I would either use intense pencils, fabric paint, or applique technique to fill in the larger blocks of color so that if I didn't want to solidly thread paint an area, you know, I would have the material there for texture and for color. And this is the technique that most people use when they do thread painting or um, art quilts. All of this practice isn't in vain because it helps me to develop timing and technique uh, for free motion quilting. I'm sure it'll be a lot better when I get one of those uh, slider mats. I've just uh, taped on um, my Coquina Teflon sheet underneath this so that nothing gets caught and slows me down because uh, if the needle doesn't keep moving, you can get in a mess. Let me 
this is near her neck. I got plants, I mean, I didn't move it in the right timing. Sometimes I get a little uh, hasty. Sometimes I just have a spaz moment and I move it too fast. One of the biggest um, issues I'm facing is uh, my eyes getting tired. I've tried using the optic magnifiers for this machine. I've tried reading glasses magnifiers. And in the end, I just stick my face close to the light here, look over top and do the best I can. Sometimes I stop and raise the needle and have a look. My eyes um, get tired, they burn a little, and then my nose starts to run. Crazy. So I might use the optical magnifiers, you know, for small details. But in the grand scheme of things, I can't see enough area to plan my next move. I just don't have enough confidence in the borders of color here. And I really wish I could have printed this out with my new printer. Because it prints beautifully and it prints accurate color, whereas this is not um, a representation of accurate color. I mean, I really tried. I used all kinds of um, ICC profiles to try to get it to work, but I couldn't get perfect color. It was a shame, but I just have to um, do color matching by eye. So yeah, there's, you know, progress is slow, but um, it's not all, it's not a race, it's more about, it's more about quality. Let me turn that up, right side up. Yeah, that one's pretty bright. a bit. There we go. Better visibility. Now let's see what I have here. Then go up a bit more and then over. Maybe a bit more speed here. So there's a couple of ladies in the group that are very masterful um, with thread painting. And I don't know how they achieve stitch uniformity. I, I just wonder if it's manual or if perhaps they're using the feed dogs because you don't necessarily have to drop the feed dogs to do thread painting but you would have to get acquainted with your reverse uh, button and do a lot of pivoting. right in here and I'll have to come back a bit. Let's 
So yeah, the greatest success I had with needles is to use the Superior 8012 top stitch needles. I tried embroidery needles. Maybe it was my technique at the time because I didn't hadn't practiced very much. But I was having at some point thread fraying and breakage. And now I haven't had any fraying or breakage, but I've had a significant amount of practice because of all the um, all the black I've had to embroider. And um, I'm learning to move things more uniformly. I'm learning how to plan where I'm going next. I don't have any more problems like that. I'm really cheap, you know. I know I have a lot of supplies and such, but I'm really cheap with my materials. I don't like to change my needle every couple hours. I'm only going to change it when I have to. Or my, um, my stitch definition is suffering. If I'm having uh, looping, if I'm having um, any terrible sounds coming from my machine, stitch quality goes down, you know, I'll consider changing the needle. And then I don't throw them out either. I uh, put them back in their little case and write a little red X over them. If they're well used, I put a heavy X. If they're lightly used, I put a light X. And then I know, you know, I have a general idea on how used that needle is and if I can use it again for something. Because um, they're expensive. The superior needles, I think they were like eight bucks for five. I think that's expensive. And I have to order them online to get them uh, for that price because um, my local shops don't carry them. And if they do carry them, they're terribly expensive. Like significantly. Now I'm in Canada. We don't have like a Joann's here. My dealer is my best source for thread and machines and accessories. And Fabricland um, is pretty much the store that I have for basic fabrics. That leads me to do a lot of my shopping for fabric online. I found uh, some wonderful sources of, of uh, you know, designer and beautiful fabrics but um, they're out west. I have to order from BC or Alberta and um, that's all right but uh, I wish I had a local store. Generally I uh, make welding hats. I silk screen the text. I, c I make the um, vinyl text template uh, with my silhouette cutter so that I get really professional looking text. And I make the hats out of uh, quilting cotton. So I like to have uh, a nice selection of fabrics. Over the past uh, year and a half, I've perfected my pattern. You know, everybody starts with a base pattern and then they um, if you make something a lot, you end up tweaking it uh, to be better over time. I guess it's the same with anything. Different people are going to develop different techniques, even for thread painting. It's like um, two people who draw the same picture. You know, they're, they're going to look different because everybody has um, their distinct way of interpreting the picture and painting it. And I've always been a painter. That, that's what I did in, um, 
in my youth. I used to paint and draw. I don't do that anymore, but I use um, I use thread now, and I use paints, fabric paints. You know, that's pretty much my artistic outlet now, as is um, photography. And since I got my photo printer, my Canon, um, I'll probably do a lot more um, photo work, compositing, and printing, and maybe some of those items will be turned into thread paintings. In the near future, I hope to make my first quilt. I have all the materials for it. I've chosen flannel. Yes, I'm going to make a quilt totally out of cotton flannel. And um, I know I'm going to have to uh, starch the crap out of all of the panels before I work with them because flannel has a tendency to stretch um, when you're working with it. So it's a good idea to starch it. So I have all of that stuff. Um, I have a wool batting because I want it to be warm. And um, my batting is actually a king size, but I'm probably going to cut the size down for first quilt and maybe make a twin or something. So um, during all this time, that's all I got done. Not a great deal. a few holes so I'm just filling them in. Yeah, so I'm just rambling on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't like those thumps. It just tells me there's a build up of thread on the underside. I'm not worried about it, but at some point I will have to change this needle. I purchased some um, Schmetz chrome needles, and they're supposed to be more durable, and they're not supposed to heat up, so that won't really have uh, much, the heat won't have much repercussion on my stitching, because I'm not going that fast, but when you're free motion quilting, that, that might. I would really like to get some practice in for free motion uh, quilting, for design, you know, for free motion uh, movement of designing, you know, with the stippling or whatever, whatever you're going to free motion. I have the rulers too, but I have to learn how to do that. And I'll probably pick a project to learn, just like I picked this project to learn thread painting. I wanted an embroidery machine, you know, maybe the Janome 500E, but you know, a $2,000 Canadian, it's just not in the budget at the moment. I think it's a little selfish to want another machine so soon. So I decided I was going to learn to thread paint. And I realized that this is really a skill that I want to develop anyways. I would love to be able to uh, machine embroider um, text on the welding hats I make, and I don't think free, you know this free motion thread painting is, is the answer to that. But uh, that can wait because at the moment I'm doing the screen printing method. Any acrylic paints can be made into a textile or fabric paint using a textile medium. I have a couple of different brands that work well. And then you heat set it with an iron and a pressing cloth and it's permanent. Like I said, I can't see the lines well enough to go faster. Well, I could, but I would rather be sure of where I'm going next. There's 
my bad eyes to begin with. Yeah, I know, I know. When I first did the black on, you know, the large area on Cookie's coat, I used the zigzag foot in free motion quilting and went sideways to do a fill-in stitch. But I'm just not really good at that yet to get uniform stitching. I like to go in the direction that the fur is naturally flowing. And um, straight stitching makes that easier. Some people only do their thread painting with straight stitch. Others use a combination of the zigzag stitch at varying widths. And ideally, I would like to be able to use the variable zigzag for thread painting. But my, um, my knee lift bangs against the, um, the bars on my table and uh, seems to impair the functionality so that I can't open my stitch up at the widest width because it bangs the table and limits limits um, how far the the lift can go. I just think that's odd, you know, that this is the setup and there's still that issue. Not all of us uh, can even reach our knee lift. I have to uh, really move over quite a bit to do it, but um, I can do it. However, it clanks. I open it up. I hit the table, and I don't like that. Get enough coverage yet to get in there and look. Let me come up one more sweep. Back and forth, back and forth. Then I'd like to take the camera off the tripod and give you all a close-up view of some of the stitching. Some of these colors are open to interpretation because, you know, they might be a dark gray, but I'm making them black right now. And later, I'm going to uh, put the picture um, up in front of me and do the fine tuning of the color, you know, the highlights. So um, I will be stitching on top of some of the black with lighter colors to give it dimension. And that's when the picture will really come alive. A lot of mistakes will be covered up. And... Um, I can fix anything that I don't like about it because I can't judge things as close necessarily. I'm only close to stitch. And you need to um, look at something from a distance because that's how it's going to be viewed when it's finished. I don't want to make all my judgments so close. Because that's not how it's going to be viewed. You see, I just keep going back and forth, back and forth, laying down additional layers. So I want you all to consider the light that you're working under. You know, for some things you need more than just your um, machine light, the, the LEDs on your machine. You may have to set up some lights around your work area that shine on your work. And you have to make judgments about thread color under the appropriate spectrum of light. I recommend the 5000K unless something is going to be in, in a southern window or southern sun shining on it, 
Then you might want to go to the 6500K, which is the brightest spectrum of daylight. That's my favorite light, but this is a realistic uh, compromise. It's um, generally a standard of light anyways um, for artists and um, photo uh, editors, photographers. The pictures were taken in this room under the same light so that I could have some consistency. I still brightened them up when I brought them into Photoshop. I had to composite two photos because there's no way these guys will pose together. And uh, I still feel some artistic liberty, you know, to, to make subtle changes to the photo if I want. But this is my interpretation. That's what our artwork is. It's an interpretation of something. It's, you know, viewed through my eye. how I see it. So not everything has to be exact. But I would like the general features to be exact, the general colors to be exact, if possible. I've seen people um, do work where they've used um, different stitches of their machine, you know, fancy stitches, as part of the fill. Um, for even pet portraits, and it's it's gorgeous. They've done it on top of that applique, and it's beautiful. So in that case, you know, the color does not have to be exact. It's uh, kind of like an abstract interpretation of a portrait. This one is more photorealistic. Keep in mind, you know, this is my first project. Not a professional, but I've had enough hours on this so far to learn a few things. And I want to share them with you as I hope somebody would share with me. You know, not just um, my, my work, but how I achieved it and things that I would want to know if I, you know, if I was wanting to try it, try it for the first time. I hope I could save somebody time and materials and money, you know. Um, just by sharing what I've learned, uh, you know, I think that's awesome. I'm not worried about anybody stealing any technique or whatnot, because everybody develops their own. And that's the wonderful thing about artwork. It's very individual. Each person is unique. So most of the thread paintings that I've seen online, even the professional ones, are much smaller. A large thread painting might be, you know, an 8 by 10. So I realize, you know, I'm just, I'm a little nuts. But um, this is what it took for me to get interested enough, you know, to, uh, to do this project. This is what I wanted to do, and I wanted it to be big so that I could hang it on the wall, and it would be uh, a large piece, poster size. I've heard of people doing these kinds of work and then resin coating them. You know, you probably want to put it on a a hard background first, mount it, spray it with a permanent adhesive, and then have it resin coated. But I'm not sure I would want to resin coat this. So I've gotten all kinds of ideas, but um, can't try everything at once. Sure, we're just burning away the uh, space on the camera there, the battery. And then I'm going to turn it off for a bit and finish this up. 
then I might turn it back on and get close up and try to show off some of the detail on this so you can see what the stitching looks like close up if I can get it close enough and get it under the right light there goes my nose I'm going to go find a Kleenex alright see you in a bit All right, I'm back. I did most of the fill-in that I could see. I've got her little speckled spots on her back. And as you can see, I just lifted the needle and jumped over instead of cutting and restarting again, which is a little more time consuming. This is a lot easier. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to trim off these threads now of all the jumps which they'll hold because they're all like individual knots. Once you stitch over a, a one area enough, you know, it's pretty much secure. Now, I have the idea that when all of this is done, just to be sure that it doesn't get snags or anything, that I might put a coat of fabric glue on the back, uh, on the underside, to keep all the stitches secured because over time, uh, friction, you know, washing and whatever, you might be able to either um, snag the threads or they might get worn and shred and then start to uh, fray. So that's an idea anyways that I might consider. get these all done. doesn't matter how accurate it is. Some of these are just here so I know where to place some shadow um, when I do dark gray or light gray. It's not all black and white modeling. She has a number of colors in the back of her coat. You get the general idea here, right? Okay, I'm going to cut here and turn the camera off, and I'm going to come back to show you some of the detail when I'm done. All right, so I'm back here. Now, um, you know, I could probably work some more black into the shadow on her legs, but that's at this point, it's not her true color. It's going to be a dark shadow, so I'm going to add it later. A little buckling of the paper here, but that's all right. So I just wanted to zoom in and give you an idea of the stitching, what it was like. Especially we've got these heavy, heavy um, stitched areas. Now over here I had a little bit of eyelashing on the top and I stitched over it with my F2 foot, that's what I mentioned earlier and it gave me a much smoother surface without anything um, looping on the top. Now this is, uh, had some directional challenge there so I'm probably going to go over that at some point. And I've uh, drawn some lines here with pencil just to show the muscular contour of her body because that will help me with the shading. Um, my artistic background, you know, that's things I consider um, because the picture may not always have clear shading. There's a little heart in the back. That's the stitching that I just did. Oh, I forgot a spot. Yeah, I did. Okay, I want to shade that in. And then I'll be done with the black. That's a close-up of the stitching, anyhow. be interesting to see what it looks like when the solve is removed. That's a lot of dense stitching. So we'll leave it at that for now. And I'll be back later, possibly. We'll see. There's the modeling I just trimmed. Um, a lot of that is not going to be true black. As you can see here, she has modeling. Uh, 
So I'm going to be stitching around that and over that, um, you know, like with dark gray or whatever. But um, putting some stitching there gives me a guideline. And you can see um, I left these areas open because I'm going to do them in a silver. Not silver per se, but a, a gray color that looks silvery because it's the sheen on her coat. So there's no point in even filling that. I could, but it's, you know, it's not going to be easy to know where to put that color if I do. So this is just left there to give me a guideline. So you can see the difference in color here. This is true color, and this is not. This is from my old printer. This is from my new printer. So this is what I'm going by for color. Alright, see you later.